Uh, thanks for that uh, introduction, Doug, and um, thanks for staying at this stage of the afternoon. Lunchtime has been, and I really appreciate that, uh, that in looking for knowledge and looking for engagement uh, that you are here, and that's what matters. So but before I kick off uh, and to address some of the slides and some of my thoughts, um, like Doug acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're gathered on here today, so the Yori Order mob. And in, in my reach in my career, Doug mentioned my <laughs> beginnings as a park ranger, which was in Kakadu. And I actually had the experience there of um, working with people who had met their very first white fellow 70 or 80 years ago, as the early buffalo shooters came on to the floodplains of Kakadu. And they were still alive and still with much memory and much tradition. That, uh, that line runs unbroken through much of Northern Australia, Central Australia. And so recently I was in the Western deserts of WA uh, with Lena and Rita. And Lena was born at Wells 7 on the Canning Stock Route uh, and carried from that country in a Coolum. And Lena is one of the smartest wranglers of conservation action plans I've come across. She musters her mob well, gets the objective clear, helps people understand there's a process of foot and reminds them that their objective is out in front of them, that is, looking after country. There's a whole lot of people like that around Australia, and just it's a great reminder of those long, deep tracks that run through Australia around Aboriginal people. In fact, um, you know, just recently, a new book published, uh, Dark Emu, Black Seeds, a bit of a reinterpretation of the notion of hunter-gatherer existence and in fact agricultural occupancy and stewardship of land. So a Premier's Literary Prize just, uh, just awarded recently. Another book that's really informed my recent thinking, if you really want to dig in a bit and understand heart and mind about caring for country, a guy called John Bradley is at Monash University and there's a very nicely reviewed book if you just dip in it, it's called Singing Saltwater Country and it goes to the depth of that cultural line through landscapes. It's a really interesting read because it brings together uh, chaplains' lines around song lines and where significant landmarks make the story of country. And so Val, earlier on we talked about Mount Elephant, where are you Val? What a great yarn, what a great yarn. But in a sense, where Val and the supporters of that space are, is that they're like all of us, are on cultural landscapes. Shaped today by what we do, but shaped before us by Aboriginal people. And it's a really interesting continuum to play with when you think about the inheritance of space and opportunity, but also uh, dare I say, I'll make some links in terms of fundraising. So I'll come back to that. But I did want to mention uh, uh, those two particular things. And I give great credit to people like Damien Bell and the uh, Gwinnich Mara mob uh, around, think about Lake Conda and that sort of cultural landscape story. And I think about the Order and, and, and the Atkinsons and all that mob and what they have to offer in terms of our engagement. Um, as when I was out in the Western Desert, Lena and Rita and others said, um, we've never gone away. And if you want to go to the evidence, 45,000 years of archaeological history here that says we've been here for a fair while, we can talk to you about things that, that might make a difference. So, interesting about conservation fundraising. So already I've started by just telling a couple of stories, and I'll keep coming back to this theme, and come back to authenticity and how to engage people as you think about what it is you're doing. And Val, your story is a, a tremendous story because it goes to, goes to the cause and belief and passion for that cause. And did people get excited when they saw, my God, there's an opportunity, we can actually do something with Mount Elton for the first time? And I love the story about the toast. Okay? Mm -hmm. Stories are really important when you're thinking about connecting heart and mind and I'm reminded sometimes that storytelling, after all, is all we ever had for a long time until we invented other ways of, in fact, communicating information. So that story, I really resonated about that. And from a small idea, with the trust for nature coming on board, I reckon the outcome was inevitable. There was no doubt, really. Because all that ever happens in these cases when you set out to do something, uh, 
and I won't try and paraphrase this, but a small group of people, when they really set out to do something, are bloody near unstoppable. Okay? Look at what you've got now. You've got a dilemma. How do we build something? How do we manage this? How do we do that? An outcome, almost beyond what you thought you might be able to achieve first. And the other thing about that in philanthropy, so the donor, I didn't get the name, I probably should have, I should have written that, written that one down, but anyway, half a million dollars. So why did they do that? Why did they give a half a million dollars? I won't do Q&A here, but, but they had a look at who they were dealing with, and they looked at a group of people that were passionate, committed, driven, in fact, to get an outcome, and who totally believed in what they were doing. And, and the philanthropists are saying, I reckon I can back that, and through them and with them, make a difference. And so from that, philanthropists have been doing that sort of thing for a long time. So just a, a broad question, I guess, uh, who in the room just to, has ever given money to a fundraising cause? Pretty much, <laughs> probably see everyone's hands up around the room. Welcome to the world of philanthropy. <coughs> Who's bought a raffle ticket at the local sporting club? Fundraising. Look at that, you know, right around the room. Some of you may have led that sort of activities. So you're already in the business. You are already in the business of fundraising. And if you've ever given, you're, you're a philanthropist. You are trying to achieve, through your giving, something that's just bigger than you could probably do yourselves. And uh, Doug Humane, uh, Doug led Bush Heritage for a long time, and but before him was other people. And one of the first motivators, I guess, around the passion of Bush Heritage, spit a little bit where we came from, was a bloke called uh, Bob Brown. And Bob had made a decision to bid on a block of land that he thought was a bit like a Mount Elephant site, too good to go the way of the West, basically, too good to lose. And, and he bought it at auction for a ridiculous price at the time, and he didn't have enough money. He actually had enough for a deposit, but then he had to go and get the balance of it. And, and to that extent, he actually went and got a bank loan. And, uh, and to that extent, there was a bank that was prepared to back him. And out of that, the bank loan then needed to be paid. And, and some people rally around that and said, I reckon that's a really good idea. And, and one of the people who put their hand up, I won't go to his full name, but Doug knows who he is, the fellow in Wagga, he was our supporter number 27, and they're a nice story, we, we actually track our supporters through a comprehensive database system uh, to maintain a lifelong relationship with those supporters, not just a once-off, but a lifelong relationship, so Peter joined up, I think his initial donation was about 50 bucks, let's say, but it's where he started. And I said to him when I first met him in 2011, I said to Peter, by this stage he'd given nearly a quarter of a million dollars in donations to the organisation. I said, Peter, so what, what motivated you? And, and he said, I want to be part of something much greater than I could do by myself. I wanted to build something that lasted and which really mattered. Now, in February last year, I went to visit Peter again in, in an aged care facility, again in Wagga, and he was dying. And he wanted to know of me, would I do well with his legacy? Was Bush Heritage the right organisation to, in fact, uh, look after his legacy? And, and we sat across the kitchen table as these things happened and looked us in the eye and, and he said, I trust him. And so Peter's estate came through the other day at three and a half million dollars. Okay? A lifelong journey of association with the organisation, trust, motivation, long term thinking, contribution to a good which was greater than he could do by himself. So, in a general sense, I, I just make those sort of opening comments and I want to go a little bit more to Bush Heritage, but think about what I've just said. The art of fundraising sometimes is authenticity. Does it come from the heart? A good story. Are you good at telling people in simple terms what it is you're trying to do? Does it matter to them? Does it give them hope and opportunity to do something greater than they could do by themselves? And are you well organised to deliver on your promise? 
Will you actually deliver what you said you were going to do? Because that, that's very important. So let me just click through a couple of things here. Um, where we operate, we operate as an Australian-wide organisation. Uh, it is our 25th year of operation. Uh, we started with a block of 11 hectares. We now own uh, well over a million hectares in our own right, which is set aside purely for conservation. And we work with Aboriginal people across another six and a half, depending on which part of the story we're up to, nearly 10 million hectares of land in Australia where we work with other people to deliver conservation outcomes. That's a big reach for an organisation that started with 11 hectares in 25 years. Uh, the zones area are really just for our reference to say these are the areas where we've decided <coughs> relative to the comprehensive adequate and representative reserve system, the, the national car system and the national reserve system. This is our bit. This is where we work well. This is where we're going to make a contribution. Being really clear and specific about what the value proposition is. And so I mentioned 25 years. We started inside the fence and we've gone from local to national. And effectively, Doug and Philip Toyne, and I mentioned just briefly Philip Toyne and, and Rick Farley, uh, founders of Landcare, both former board members and president of Bush Heritage, amazing contributors uh, when you think about what conversations they kicked off in their lifetime, sadly, both have passed. But private resources, I think this is a really thing, and you all know this well in this room, private resources as a counterpoint to government funding. So we all know everyone in this room, the government's shrinking ability here, yeah, private resources. Who's had, who hasn't had their budget cut by a productivity cut in recent times in this sector? Yep, that's pretty tight. And so part of the thinking and opportunity is indeed in this philanthropic space. So what can the philanthropic sector do as some counterpoint to that change in the landscape? And I think the last point here, which is really exciting, is impact investment. Uh, to drive economic opportunity in Australia and deliver environmental outcomes. And so at the highest end level, if you said, well, let's say we've got a, a billion dollar environmental challenge ahead of us, uh, let's say through government money at the moment we've got 300 million in the pot, broadly speaking, at state and federal level. It might be 350, it might be 400. There's a gap. So where's the gap going to come from if you've still got an issue? And the gap has got to be explored in innovative ways elsewhere and find other connections. And Doug mentioned corporate landscape, and I will come back to that. But these are, these are a bit of background thinking. So key in what we try and do, and what you're, you're doing, and I really appreciated our earlier um, presentation from Dale around science, we just have to keep investing in science. Scratch it, find it, bite it off, chew it. But science is one of those key informers of good quality policy and decision making. So Bush Heritage continues to invest in science, and I was delighted to see Tim as one of the co-collaborators. We've invested a bit ourselves through Tim in his PhD to achieve, uh, Tim Doherty, which is one of the featured people in the slide, to achieve a better understanding of the cat impacts and ecology at Charles Darwin Reserve in West Australia. So science with flagship themes, landscape connectivity, what we're talking about here, habitat refugia, and I think there's some nice evidence about what refugia started to look like. In, in, in Dale's presentation. <coughs> and following those little boxes through down to the bottom right hand corner, you could see a bit more structure and a bit of, bit of vertical as well as spatial uh, relationships were pretty important. Introduced species and overabundant native species, fire ecology, threatened species, and restoration ecology, including priority species. I, I, we're engaged in a project at the moment to get burrowing betongs, and Neil, forgive me here, I've outrageously stolen one of Neil's great lines. He has many, and uh, as a colleague that I've known for a long time, uh, one of the smartest innovative lateral thinkers, but Neil talked about putting the pictures back on the wall of the art gallery. Okay, so we're rewilding Bonbon Station in South Australia by getting Benongs and Bilbies back into the landscape because we want to recharge some of the fungal ecology and some of the distribution of plants and some of the disturbance ecology that goes with those species. But this whole notion of of landscape restoration isn't just about planting trees. And Paul, there are other elements in this space, of course. Let's rewild some parts of it, and you can start small. So we've got a major major project underway with the Potter Foundation to get burrowing bedongs or booties and bilbies back into that landscape. Big challenge, but we think it's the stage we're up to. We've acquired the property, we've stabilised it, it's ready to go to the next level. So science is helping drive that. A couple of our reserves. Um, <coughs> Uh, 
topical one at the moment is uh, this road preserving Western Queensland. We've bought the land on which the night parrot has been rediscovered and we're leading the process of um, research and discovery around the night parrot and that's a very exciting project that uh, some of the room will know. Um, uh, the bird watching world is a really interesting space when it comes to uh, to, uh, to competition, let me put it that way. It's a very interesting space, but some astonishing stuff in three years delivered by scientists about an animal that we scarcely knew existed anymore, let alone now we have a really, really good handle on what's going on with night parrots. It's quite quite exciting. Hamlin Station in the west, uh, Nari Station up in the in the, uh, the Paru Warrigo country, Niffy where it all started in Tasmania. Just some of the, the sort of place names and markers on the map to carve out where we're operating and what we can do. Go to the next stage here, the Tassie Midlands. This is relevant and interesting. This is important, okay? Uh, the team at Bush Heritage were looking for a solution to an intractable problem. How to deal with native grasslands in a high productivity agricultural landscape, known for its fine wool, particularly the Saxon Merino and Merino flocks in that landscape. Farmers didn't want to deal with government. Government regulation wasn't working and other solutions had to be found. So a smart group of people put together an idea to establish a trust fund. It's actually called the Midlands Conservation Fund. Philanthropy funded that fund, so a number of major foundations came on board and started it up. It sits just under $400 million in that fund at the present time, and the dividend from our smart investment off that is used to fund contracts with farmers to conserve grasslands on their property in their agricultural production cycle and systems. So the farmers are still in custody and they're delivering, they're delivering, I think, groundbreaking or leading grassland conservation in the country. And so that's a really just an innovative <coughs> lateral way of saying, how do we skin this cat? If, if regulation failed, and indeed it did, when a native vegetation clearing ban was brought in and then moratorium for three years, a whole lot of people rushed out and converted grassland to crop. They said, oh, well, three years, it's great. It's an opportunity to convert here. Yeah? So it's quite a perverse regulatory outcome. So the system that operates now is we've got a queue of farmers out, out the door looking to set aside farmland and get guaranteed income year on year through a contractual income to set aside and manage grassland in the way that it's been managed for a very long time. And then, of course, the proposition from that is that, is that philanthropy has gotten involved uh, and dealing with farmers who are talking about intergenerational equity. So the philanthropic groups are saying, we've been here for a very long time and will be, and we're prepared to go a long-term story and make a long-term difference. Farmers are saying, well, we want to hand on to our kids what we've inherited, and part of that is native grasslands. The two have come together quite nicely, and of course then, in a leveraged outcome, you get other investors who are saying, how do I get a piece of that outcome? Can I get involved? And you have someone who leads, like the Meyer Family Foundation did, like the Vincent Fairfax Family Foundation did, like JT Reid did, among others. And they got involved and other others said, that's a really good idea, can we replicate that? Innovation, it's a really, uh, really key part of what was and is and continues to happen at Bush Heritage. This is another really interesting one. So uh, regional leadership, what can happen? Uh, Mount Gibson Mine, up the road from our Charles Darwin Reserve in WA, a major mining company, Tony Berg sitting over the top of it, regulating and giving mine approval. And, and he sets a, a condition that says they need to invest some of their annual revenue in environmental outcomes. Now, the mine managers were saying, OK, we're going to spend that to get it out the door because the accountants say we've got to get, let's say, $150,000, $200,000 out the door each year. So who can we give that money to to get an outcome? And instead of it going in that direction, which is pretty one-dimensional, there was a group of people who said, how can we leverage this? And so there's an organisation <coughs> under our leadership, um, which was formed called the Gundera Association, who effectively pooled their money and they made it into $300,000. And as a community, then they said, how should we spend this for best effect for the community? So the three projects that they chose were, to start it off, was Malifau Research, over 2 million hectares. So we were running on 65, and the mine's about 200. And next to us is Mount Gibson run by AWC. And up the road's an indigenous protected area. There's four or five state conservation reserves. And then there's a whole lot of farmland with rendered vegetation. Bring those together under the association with the shires. And all of a sudden, you're leveraging a whole lot of other resources. Now, the other two projects they worked on or are working on is youth leadership and development. 
for the kids in the school to give them pathways for career and jobs. Very important and relevant at a community. And the next thing they're working on is soil fertility on farming lands to maintain sustainable productivity on those areas. All leveraged off what would have been a one-track grant process. And so really you can see that the prospect of collaboration and leveraging is very attractive to other investors who come into that landscape. So the very first year we held a music festival in the property, Blues to the Bush, we had a modest turn up, 450 people and no MPs. Guess what happened next time we held? <coughs> a thousand people, three MPs, including the federal member, who turned up to come and have a look at what was going on in this community that made them stand out as a group who found a way to actually leverage and collaborate in a way which didn't exist before. All of that off a gift of philanthropy. Chris Darwin's gift. It's the Charles Darwin next. So good to what's going on. And here's the last one I'll talk about briefly. All Very Healthy Country Plan, and Doug was at the launch of this plan, and uh, including the Indigenous Protected Area Declaration. This, uh, this uh, project largely, and, and much of our work has leveraged off a single donor overseas who had a particular interest in this landscape and, and some outcomes in this part of the world. So this is now 10 years in as a partnership. So Doug, it took a while to get to the declaration, but we've just had a major five-year review of this particular project. Aboriginal people with our support looking after country and bringing their traditional knowledge and perspectives to it has been a real powerhouse of, of ideas and application of two-way science. So bringing our science to bear through Tom Vigilante with the science of the elders and the community. The spin-offs for this are really significant. Pride, real hard stuff. Um, I've got a job. I'm a ranger. A ranger badge in that country is the seal on the shirts here. Ranger badge in that country is like top status symbol. I'm a ranger. It's an amazing thing of pride. It also denotes my country. Each of those rangers have a for their district. And you'll hear this um, in some of the debates around the country at the moment. You'll hear that as a as an identification of my country as well. It's about where I come from. It's about my place. And one of the elders said to us at one stage, he said, you take me off my country, I don't exist. I only really exist on this land. And that's that identification. And some people whose families and generations will know that the biggest wrench a family of farming has ever made is when Dad sells the farm. It's been with his father and my father and me. And I had hoped that my son or daughter these days, but increasingly, might have had that land. That wrench that occurs when you take someone away from country that they deeply identify with, can you imagine that compounded over centuries? It's a really interesting thing to think through. So look, all of these things resonate very strongly, and I won't go into great detail here around the Upper Murray Reach project, but talk about how to motivate supporters. Um, we needed a, uh, we're working with the, um, the, the Landcare, sorry, the NRM group there around the project to support uh, conservation of Murray Cod in the river. And we needed someone, we needed a way to catch carp um, in a particular part of the river, which was a major breeding hole. And we said, we just put it out onto our volunteer base and said, has anyone got a smart idea about how to trap carp? Because we need a heated carp trap. And within weeks, we had a prototype model off our volunteer base of someone who had invented a trap that would, in cooler water, attract carp to the warmer water and catch them in that particular hole. It was a great engagement strategy, I might say, and was a reminder of the skills that are out there if only you ask sometimes for help. So. It's a really interesting uh, further project, but I want to just go on briefly and I'll sum up my thoughts about, about um, conservation fundraising. Um, in, in a general sense, the cause is really important. We, we were reminded of Mount Elephant. Engaging with people, talking to people, finding things in common and establishing a common purpose or interest. That's a fundamental part of, of any sound fundraising strategy. <coughs> Authenticity, I've already mentioned an ability to actually deliver what you say you're going to do. Belief that you will actually do good with my money if I give it to you. Uh, so those relationships were incredibly important. And I mentioned Peter, and we had maintained, as I, um, as I had a conversation over the table with, uh, with two brothers from a distinguished family in Melbourne, who gave us a very significant gift for our work. And I mean, each year, eye-wateringly significant gift. And they, they both said, 
What we really like about Bush Heritage is your relationships with us. You respect what we are on about, you give opportunity for us to achieve through you, but as soon as you get the cheque, you don't wave us off. You're talking to us all the time, you're engaging with us, you're actually building a relationship. We feel part of the team. And that was a fundamental lesson in fundraising, I think. So you don't just go out the door and ask for the cheque and disappear. That's a fundamental relationship between your donors and, and what they're trying to achieve. In Bush Heritage terms, four quick things. Um, direct marketing. All of you will be getting letters through your post box at some level around direct marketing appeals. It raises most of the money in philanthropy in Australia at the present time, including face-to-face -face fundraising on street corners. 57% of all money raised in the UK is through face-to-face uh, -face or direct marketing fundraising. Um, major donors, I've alluded to the major donor component of how we raise funds. Uh, bequesters, I mentioned the story of Peter particularly. Um, we have an outstanding bequester support base, um, which to us over time gives us a fundamental underlying base load of revenue that you can bank on year in, year out. And that's a long-term relationship. Um, been built up over 25 years, one of the best in the country. Um, so major donors, bequesters, direct marketing, and, and don't be afraid to ask. Can I tell you the most simple words that you'll use in fundraising? Here's my pitch. You've heard about what Bush Heritage does. How would you like to support us by making a gift today to our work? Temptation for the person asking the question is to keep talking. And the smartest thing you'll do is shut up and let someone think about what you've asked them. And they might just, after thinking about it, say one of three things No, I'm not convinced about your work, um, but I'm interested. Um, good on you. They might say, I'll think about that and come back to you. Or they might just say, Yes, I want to support what you do and here's an amount of money to help you on your way. From that starts a relationship. So fundraising is a profession. It's a highly skilled activity. You present innovative ideas, which people relate to, opportunities for them to directly engage and be involved, <coughs> then I won't say it's an assured thing, but you're halfway there to the prospect of raising resources from private people uh, towards your objectives. And the other beautiful thing about that that I really, really like is that it's entirely democratic. Completely democratic. You don't have to, but you choose to. There's no one telling you you have to do this. But by getting involved and by giving to that cause, you set up a direct line of sight between your heart and your head towards what you want to see happen. And I think that's an incredibly powerful thing to get involved in where you give to a cause you believe in, and with the right steerage and shaping, you get the results you're after, with a very direct line of sight between you and what happens. And for many of us, I, I would put a challenge to those in the Gubby space. I didn't know enough about this when I got involved. I knew not enough. And I'm still learning, and I learn every single day. But I would put it to you, one of the greatest opportunities still within the government sector is actually take yourself out of that government sector and get some exposure in the not-for-profit sector. Not only does it sharpen your thinking when you know you've got to raise every single dollar you're going to spend that year, every single one of them. So Bush Heritage has no substantial government income at all in our balance sheet. None. So we've got to raise every dollar we spend. And that's a very great motivator on a Monday morning when you think, what can I do today to make sure Bush Heritage can fulfil its purpose? So it's a motivator, but and, you know the other side of it can be a bit intimidating, but it's a motivator. And so, so out of that, I, I hope I've been able to give you an insight a little bit about it, one of Australia's leading not-for-profit environment organisations. Some of the business of raising funds, there's the business side of it, and then there's what I think is good storytelling, heart and motivation, and be clear about your purpose. And, and from there, simply ask people, um, we've come on board.
help us do this thing. And I'll go back to Mount Elephant. Um, it's a nice problem to have. You know, the centre of these things um, uh, are part of your goal. So where will we be in 100 years time, 500 years time? I like to go back and think about the old adage that helped motivate some of the Land Conservation Council. We're trying to think as if for a thousand years, I know that's hard and change is happening all around you, but thinking long term and saying, as Doug Stewart at an organisation, that's my job is to take it forward, pick it up, bring it forward, keep it in good shape and deliver on the promise to secure and protect Australia's most precious. So thanks for the opportunity, Neil. Thanks for everyone. And any questions, I'm happy to open up. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. Um, I think out of that, we took some very clear take-home messages. If you're putting your pitch up and putting a sell out, to be passionate, committed, and driven to achieve an outcome. Um, and some of those great case studies about how mm. partnerships can really leverage you. Philanthropic um, dollars, whether it's with individual land managers, community groups, or the Aboriginal community. Um, so we've got probably time for one or two questions. Does anyone have a question for Jerry? Yes. This is a bit out of the left field, but I really enjoyed this book, and I have seen some of the research, and it's really absolutely um, But where I live, which is a, you know, a lovely part of North a lot of the land comes under part Victorian management. Yes. And I've noticed over the 40 years or so I've been there, certainly a decline in numbers of species. And I wondered if there was a point at which there was an interface between the sorts of organisations like mm. and the government agencies <coughs> where this sort of work could be encouraged and prosper um, somehow. Look, um, I believe there is, and, um, and it goes to this comment that I've made before. Make no mistake, um, everyone in Parks Victoria would like to spend more money on the land that they've got under their stewardship. This is a key point that I've, you know, you hear criticism of the park services and their land base. Look, don't, don't be tempted. Um, it's all very well at one level, yes, but the park network still remains the fundamental cornerstone or blocks of our biodiversity strategy in Victoria. And great credit, by the way, to Lisa Neville for actually recharging that debate and getting it out and getting it refreshed, as it were, because believe it or not, the last time it was written, I actually was one of the four people on the steering committee that decided that old strategy in 1997. So the new one was well and truly due for a re refresh. So great credit to the current government for actually refreshing the biodiversity strategy. But the, the way ahead, I think, given that, that in this, this um, broader space here, the private resources and counterpoint to reducing government capacity. In Queensland, Western Australia and South Australia, we're actually in very detailed discussions with state agencies. So Hamlin Reserves, which is just a brand new e for us, um, it's 200,000 hectares. It's right on the World Heritage Area of Shark Bay. So we're right in discussions now with Jim Sharp, the Director General of the Park Service there, the Regional Development Commission and a bunch of other folks to say, how could we actually bring our expertise to offset some of the lack of capacity in that area. Now, it doesn't come without cost and it doesn't come without risk, but out of that collaboration at that level, Queensland's the same. So we're having a conversation with the Queensland government and I'm cautious about picking up sovereign risk in this landscape, but collaboration, even at the local level, weeds across the fence, for goodness sake, go outside the boundaries. And Doug knows this well, uh, staying inside the boundaries is safe. Um, but outside the boundaries is the frontier where I think you learn most. And through collaboration and cooperation across those lines, working with not-for-profits is a smart way to do things. So Jill, I, I just hope um, we see a little more of that. And I know the Trust for Nature, uh, who I'm a great fan for, so Vic and I catch up a lot and yarn about where do we inter intersect. Trust for Nature is one of the best sleeping giants in Victoria going around. So. So already effective and wide-reaching, but there's a great opportunity, I think, to lift that. And uh, I would really like to see, like in Canada, the sovereign governments invest a serious amount of money in the revolving fund, a serious amount of money, to power up what can be done on private land, and both on private land and across the boundaries with the state agencies. It would be a hugely leveraged thing if, um, if the Vic governments stuck $100 million in the 
in the in the revolving fund just like that and said, okay, there's a down payment on everything that can be done and then work with Landcare and a bunch of others to leverage that money and keep it moving to get outcomes. Uh, and I think that would be a really smart move. Um, I, at a national level, why wouldn't the Fed stick 250 mil in a sovereign trust fund to actually drive and leverage opportunities, not just in grant money, but in smart ways that keep the money moving and keep it going. So to me, Jill, there's opportunity out there that, that we could be working with. Uh, another question, uh, Glenn. Uh, yeah, I've just got a question about um, donor fatigue or philanthropy fatigue, and, and I, you made a really compelling case for demonstrating how to make your case in this bush heritage yeah. appealing and, yeah. and drive the passion for people. But, yeah. but um, I suppose the question is, you made a really good case for perhaps how important the, the major donors and the bequest component yeah. is compared to the, the bulk of people who uh, would otherwise support. It's, it's, it's a good call out if you can. Um, the, the, the longevity of Bush Heritage, and, and this was demonstrated really clearly through the global financial crisis, when you go back and analyse the data, the donors that actually didn't didn't waver on the on the metre were the $25 a week donors, or $25 a fortnight, out of the pay packet, regular giving. And and fatigue is, a, is an interesting sort of question. I think, I think there's an element of overwhelm, but also sometimes loss of faith, which goes to this question of fatigue, or indeed genuine hardship. But out of that, the regular donor is an incredibly important part of building a, a long-term base that you can actually plan on. So major donors can come and go, and if you get too used to a small major donor group, I think it's a weak business strategy to do that uh, because when the portfolio goes up and down, the dividend may be less that year. Uh, you drop one donor at $25, it doesn't hurt that much. You drop two at $100,000 each, it hurts a lot. That's four people's jobs pretty quickly. So, so the regular giving you and me type folks, so um, commitment to the, to the like Neil's done, I actually donate a proportion of my salary each year to my own organisation, and that's part of my commitment to our work, I believe, and what we do. Um, it's easy to do, uh, a regular giving thing. Most people forget that they've done it even, and as long as they're kept in touch with the journey, uh, regular giving is a fabulous way to get engaged. And as I said with Peter and others, they've started out with a tiny gift, and for the recipient at some stage down the track, it might just turn into a bequest which waters your eyes a bit. I, I, I literally sat across the table last week from a donor who, who quite possibly uh, will make the largest philanthropic bequest gift seen for a very long time. Um, and once again, it was a kitchen table conversation, but that was off the back of, again, small scale engagement, testing out whether we're up to it, and that regular giving was very important. Um, for those people who get get weary of the journey, sometimes um, they ring up and might say, look, we want to stop our donation for various reasons. And we simply say, well, would you like to stay in touch? What about we just make that $10 a month? And people are almost grateful. They say, oh, that's great. I'd love to stay in touch, but I can't do 25, I can do 10. And staying in touch on the journey uh, validates not only where they've been, but where they're going. So it is, fundraising's a real art in detail once you become a tuned and advised by the professionals in the area. Yeah. I hope that gives you some further sense. Yeah. Can I just Thanks. take the final question from the lady over here, please? Well, we're not talking from that one. I can't read your name. Philippa. Philippa. Yes, yes. You, mentioned, you asked a question along with Richard about plantations earlier. Yeah. Following, yeah. yeah. well, we, um, from charities, it's, it's known that, that if people are given one child and say, do you want to donate to one child or a group of children, they yeah. prefer the one child. That's because they feel that they have more touch. Even though in reality, there's yeah. no way you can actually yeah. give to one child. What what are the what are the mechanisms that you do to push people's buttons to make them feel that they um that they really have ownership? Yeah. Uh, everybody hear the questions. Mm -hmm. So what what are the motivators? Um, um, I haven't quite got it here, but um, one of them's on this slide. Um, which one do you think it might be? Yeah. 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 You know, a, a good friend of mine who is, is a photographer, Steve Parrish, um, you know, I know Steve, I've known Steve for a long time, he used to run a, a batch of wildlife posters and uh, marine was his thing for a long time. 
Steve would say, look, sea anemones just don't sell. You know, I can't flog a poster with a sea anemone for love and money. Um, fish sometimes for the right for the right group. Um, a really good bird photograph, some lovely spots.